Hello. I'm sure you've all heard of the action replay cartridge and what it can do. Well, I've discovered what could be described as a poor person's action replay. And by that, I mean that it literally performs only one of the action replay's abilities. So, in this video, we're going to take a look at the Amiga Break, also known as the High Score Killer. So let's jump straight over to the bench and have a look at what we get. Opening the bag, we can see that we have some instructions in German. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. We've also got our chip socket thing. This looks like it will fit where our 68,000 CPU is. And then we can plug our real 68,000 CPU into the top of it. We've also got a variable resistor, possibly some kind of speed control setting, and a switch that can sit in three positions. Looking at the instructions, there's a few interesting words we can see, but through the magic of Google Translate, we can now understand the majority of what's been written. Scanning over the text, we can see this device can basically help you cheat games and beat high scores. Installation looks really easy as well. We simply remove the Motorola CPU, plug this in, and then plug the CPU back into it, just like I thought. As for its usage, it seems to have three different modes. The middle position is where it's completely disabled. With the switch in one position, the Amiga will freeze, and in the other position, you can use the variable resistor to control the speed of the Amiga. Quite interesting for such a simple little device, so let's get it installed and see what it does. <laughs> With that installed, let's power it up. And the first experiment I want to try is something a little unusual. Something I doubt they expected you to do with it. I'm going to try a demo. And warning, this contains a lot of flashing imagery. This very famous demo is state of the art by Spaceballs. And once we're past the intro, I'll try this device out. Firstly, switching it this way. Oh, and the demo just completely pauses. Putting it back to the center and it continues. Let's try the other direction. And slowly turning the knob. Oh yes, it, it really is slowing down. You can even hear the music slowing too. I'll just play around with this for a few more seconds. So from that we can get a feel of what it's actually doing and how it behaves. So let's try it for what it was intended for, something a little bit more time critical. This as I'm sure you'll recognise is Lemmings. So let's see what this device can do to this game. Interesting, we can pause everything. and slow down the lemmings too. But it's really nice that the mouse still moves at the correct speed, although I had to hold down the mouse button longer to select the skills. I could see how this could be really helpful, so let's try something else. This is Lotus Turbo Challenge 2. And despite being difficult to play whilst adjusting the controls, they actually don't really help. It seems that the game was built to take into account the speed of the CPU, keeping the car moving at the same speed. Slowing down this game just has the disadvantage of reducing the frame rate, so that's actually not very useful. In fact, it actually makes the game harder. Let's try another game. This is Quack an often overlooked game with its pleasant music and fun platform theme. And you can see here instantly, it does slow down the game. However, oh. Um. Yeah, that's not quite right. The computer's just crashed. So maybe this is not an ideal way of getting onto the high score table in this game. 
Next up, I'm going to try Super Twintress. I used to love playing this game, but not on the hard level, and you can see why. Those pieces come down really, really fast. However, with the flick of a switch and a turn of a dial, I can slow it right down. I love how the sprites in the middle aren't really affected by this, nor is the music. Well, not unless I really turn down the speed. OK, so with most games it could actually be quite useful. Now, I've had an interesting thought. This is designed to work with a Motorola 68000 CPU, and the Amiga isn't the only device I have that has one. So, I wonder, what happens if I connect this up to a Mega Drive? Well, this isn't quite as easy as with the Amiga. The 68000 CPU on the Mega Drive is actually soldered in. Or rather, it was. So, let's get it installed and boot it up. And on powering up, nothing happened. My fault, I had to reopen the case and push the CPU down harder. It just wasn't seated properly. So let's try that again. Sega! Seems to be okay. I'll try the freezing mode. Well, that appears to work. What about the slow down functionality? Well, that appears to work too. Let's try this out a little bit more. Yeah, it even slows down the music when pushed too hard. With the game slowed down this much, it's really interesting. You can actually see the different layers appear to actually update at slightly different times. You wouldn't normally be able to see that. That's cool. Anyone who's watched my channel for a while know that I like to know how things work. The thing that's most confused me about this is all of the inputs to the 68000 are digital. But we're controlling this with a variable resistor. That's an analog signal. Aside from that, how can a simple switch actually just freeze the computer without causing any problems? Well, let's take a closer look at the device. This is a close-up of the front of the device, and this the back. And it took a lot of work because some of the tracks are hidden under the chip socket, but this is a schematic for it. Now we can simplify this a little bit by noticing that pin 49 and pin 53 on the processor are actually just 5 volts and ground. So we can hide those pins. And as for the little chip on the board, well there's not much connected to that either. So we'll remove that and replace it with its equivalent symbol. Now just rotating this around to make it a little bit easier to see, there's actually only one pin left connected to the CPU. And if we have a look at the pinout for the processor, we can see that this is pin 17, called HALT. Looking at the data sheet for that pin, we can see that if you pull this pin low, the processor will stop all activity after the current cycle is complete. This means that switching the switch in one direction does exactly that. Pin 17 gets connected to ground. So that's how the freeze works. What about the slowdown effect? Let's take a closer look at the remaining part of the circuit. These are diodes. They permit current to only flow in one direction. This is a variable resistor that you can use to control the amount of slowdown. This resistor here and capacitor, when combined, can be used to generate a delay. But perhaps the most important part is this. This is a NAND gate, although in its current configuration it's just being used as a NOT gate. The most important part about this gate is this strange symbol. This tells us that the gate is actually a Schmidt trigger. This is really important and the symbol actually shows what's going on. For an input to be detected as high, the voltage needs to rise way beyond that 2.5 volt middle point. But to switch it back off again, the voltage must drop way below that middle point. This hysteresis is similar to heating systems and it helps prevent the heaters constantly switching on and off as it passes the desired temperature. 
but what's it doing here? Well, the input going into this is actually an analog signal, and if you notice, its output is fed back into the input. This can cause an oscillation. When the output of the gate is high, this finds a path through the variable resistor and diode to the other resistor, whereby it starts to charge the capacitor. Once the capacitor reaches a high enough voltage to switch on the input to the logic gate, the output of the gate switches back off again, halting the CPU. At the same time, via a different diode, this sets this side of the resistor to be ground, which slowly discharges the capacitor, and when it's discharged enough and switches off the input, the process starts all over again. Due to the way the circuit is configured, the total time of charge plus discharge is always the same. However, the variable resistor controls the speed at which either side operates. For a better understanding, let's see that in operation. I've connected up the required pins on the adapter to 5 volts and ground, and I have that halt pin connected to the oscilloscope. It's also being pulled high to 5 volts with a resistor. In the current form, the switch is in the off position, and that signal, albeit a little bit noisy, is a high 5 volts, so right now the Amiga would be running normally. Switching the switch to the left, and you can see the output drops to zero. This would halt the Amiga completely. Next up, pushing the switch in the other direction, and we can see a square wave. At the current setting, this would mean the CPU would be frozen about half of the time, so it would appear to run at half the speed. Now as I slowly twist the variable resistor, the amount of time spent at ground decreases, which means the processor runs more time than it's frozen for. And turning it the other way, it becomes more ground than 5 volts, meaning the CPU is getting slower. For such a small number of components, that's a real neat and simple solution. Personally, I think it's quite an interesting device, and it does allow you to cheat at some games. However, it doesn't really replicate any of the other action replay features, although it wasn't really supposed to. However, there's a way we can mod this to provide a closer experience. Because there's a free piece of Amiga software called HRTMon, which performs some of the tasks the action replay can. And it's not quite as advanced, but it's pretty good. The way it works is you load it in and it stays resident in memory until triggered, and the trigger method can be configured. One of the ways to trigger it is to generate a level 7 interrupt. Looking back at the 68000 CPU pinout again, you can see three pins labelled IPL0, IPL1 and IPL2. These three pins, when pulled low, combine to signal the encoded priority of the device requesting an interrupt. To generate a level 7 interrupt, we simply need to pull all three to ground. To do this, we'll need to use three diodes and a switch. The diodes are required so the three signals can't be triggered by each other. So let's get that soldered up, installed back in the Amiga, and I'll give it a try. And with it installed in the machine, I've set it up again. This time I have my A590 connected. I've got HRTMon on an ADF on the pen drive. If I open this disk up and run the preferences, I can install the program into memory and it will stay there until we turn the machine off. To prove that it's in memory and resident, I'll press the button. And there it is. Now I'm not going to claim I know how to use it, so I'll leave this here, but it does prove that the button works. Wow, for such a simple device, it's actually really interesting. Sure, it could be used for cheating in some games, and with the small modification I've made, it could also be used as a budget action replay. Although to be fair, it's nowhere near as good as the real thing. I hope you found this interesting. If you did, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and maybe hop over to my Patreon to help me make more videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.